Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this second uh, in our symposium series. Um, just a little bit about ourselves. Um, for those of you not familiar with African services, we are a multi-service human rights agency in Harlem, uh, dedicated to assisting immigrants, refugees, and asylees from across the African diaspora. Uh, we provide free and confidential health, housing, legal, social welfare, education, nutrition, and advocacy services, regardless of your immigration status or your ability to pay. So uh, today's symposium series are made possible by supporters just like you. To make a donation to us, please visit our website. Your gift supports uh, all of our services uh, for the uh, immigrant and refugee and asylee population of New York City. So we thank you for that. And um, I believe we're gonna get started with uh, our extremely special guest today, Kenyon Farrow, uh, Managing Director of Advocacy and Organizing at Prep for All. And then um, Kenyon's gonna speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then we're going to have a QA. and a So if you'd like to put any questions you may have already in the chat box uh, and or during um, uh, Kenyon's talk, uh, please feel free to populate that chat box with your questions. So as I said, I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Kenyon um, here this morning. Um, Kenyon, for me, is a fellow friend, activist, and brother. Uh, I've known each other many years, too many. Not, uh, sorry, I don't mean too many. I mean uh, a lot of years, which would show our ages. Uh, but uh, back to Kenyon, um, who is a very well-known writer, editor, and strategist, whose work has long focused on public health and infectious disease with a focus on racial, gender, and economic justice. Uh, Kenyon is the Managing Director of Advocacy and Organizing at Prep for All, and previously um, served as the co-ED of Partners for Dignity and Rights, and as the senior editor of thebody.com and thebodypro.com. Also as US and Global Health Policy Director with Treatment Action Group, TAG, and currently serves on the board of Global Black Gay Men Connect, the LGB Center of Greater Cleveland, and New York Transgender Advocacy Group. He's also known for his work with organizations such as Queers for Economic Justice, Critical Resistance, and Fierce. Um, so let me not take up any more, any more time because um, I'm, I'm really excited to hear Kenyon and I am going to hand it over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Amanda. It's so good to see you. Uh, and yeah, we will uh, keep how long we've known each other. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to, <laughs> to ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you. And thank uh, folks who are uh, attending or watching on the live stream. Um, I'm going to uh, share my slide deck now um, and talk to you a little bit about uh, Prep for All's work, um, both uh, you know, our work in terms of uh, prep access and um, also, um, you know, have um, gotten pretty active in uh, COVID-19, uh, particularly on the global vaccine access side as well. So I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So um, for those who are unfamiliar, but there are probably folks uh, who uh, I assume most folks know, but just to sort of say, so what is PrEP? Um, PrEP is, uh, oh wait, let me go back. Uh, just do this, do this part again. Uh, so a little bit about Prep for All. Um, so we're an organization uh, that was founded um, kind of originally in 2018 and got our you know 501c3 status in 2019, uh, which was founded to ignite political action to put life-saving medications into the hands of everyone who needs it. Again, as you uh, was introduced, uh, I'm the managing director of advocacy and organizing. Uh, with prep for all, so that's a little bit about um, you know kind of our mission and who we are. Um, now to talk again about um, what is prep itself. So you know prep stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, and it is the use of antiretro antiretroviral medication to prevent 
prevent acquisition of HIV, um, and not to be confused with post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP, which we've actually had for a much longer period of time, um, although access to PEP uh, is actually probably in many cases worse than access to pre-exposure prophylaxis. But specifically, um, the daily oral uh, medication, uh, which, you know, the abbreviations for the two medications in the uh, regimen, uh, TDFFTC, um, you know, brand name Truvada, was approved 10 years ago uh, by the FDA uh, in 2012. It was shown to be 99% effective in preventing um, sexual acquisition of HIV and uh, somewhere between like 74 and 84% uh, preventative for people who inject drugs or may potentially uh, acquire HIV that way. Um, and we've had um, a generic uh, version of this drug available in the United States uh, since around 2020, uh, but really last year in 2021 is when uh, generic, uh, more generic manufacturers came into the space uh, and essentially dropped the uh, cost of a 30-day supply of PrEP to $30 uh, per month, roughly. Um, so uh, again, um, the, in 2018, uh, another uh, brand name drug, uh, Descovy, was approved uh, for PrEP, but not for cisgender women or trans men. Um, and it has comparable efficacy to uh, TDFFTC. Uh, there are no generics at this point, and the brand price for that drug is $1,900 a month. Um, there's also uh, uh, what we call kind of on-demand or 211 prep. Uh, it's not approved by the FDA to be um, uh, prescribed as such, but it is discussed in the CDC guidelines and uh, is approved in some other countries. Um, it is shown to be 99% effective against uh, sexual acquisition for men who have sex with men with proper um, adherence to a lesser dose strategy. Um, and we also recently have uh, just uh, approved in 2021, at the end of 2021, uh, an every other month uh, long acting injectable shot um, uh, of a drug called cabotegravir or the brand name uh, Apertude. Um, and it's shown again to be 99% effective against sexual acquisition, um, better population level effect likely due to the adherence benefits of you know taking a, a shot because then you don't have to worry about taking a pill every day um and uh there are, are no generics uh, of course at this point and the brand price for that particular strategy is uh twenty-two thousand uh, a year twenty-two-five. so um as we can see these uh you know many of the kind of brand name strategies at this point are very expensive which is a lot of what um some of the work that prep for all works on um, so who needs PrEP versus who is getting it? So um, if you look at the one graphic on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, this is data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, that when we look at uh, Medicaid expansion states versus non-Medicaid expansion states, um, we see the one just general racial disparities in the HIV epidemic in the United States but we also see in the uh, Medicaid expansion states um, somewhat less of a, of a level of disparity. So um, for you know, Black individuals in non-Medicaid expansion states, 48% uh, of all new diagnoses in 2019 were uh, people of African descent. In the expansion states, that number was 38%. So we see that there's something uh, that is beneficial to having more of the population covered by uh, health insurance, right? Uh, through the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion is a part of that. And what we also know is that um, more uh, people of African descent in the United States live in mostly in the still in the Southern states. And so we see in most of the Southern states with only I think two exceptions at this point uh, have expanded Medicaid or three exceptions at this point have expanded Medicaid. Um, so the disparities in HIV uh, rates are uh, even kind of greater because of where uh, Black people in the United States uh, tend to live. 
So then when we compare that to um, coverage for who's using PrEP in the United States, we see also great disparities. So while 25% of uh, people eligible for PrEP um, were prescribed it in 2020, the coverage is still not equal. So as you look here, you see um, in 2020, 66% um, of all PrEP users uh, are white, um, only 16% uh, uh, Latinx or Hispanic, um, and only 9% um, people of African descent, despite uh, Blacks and, uh, and uh, Latinx folks having a greater uh, disparity in HIV in the United States. One way to sort of look at this and why this is so, um, you know, kind of uh, disgusting, frankly, if we don't talk about the disparities and and where we've come. So, uh, you know, in twenty uh, roughly around twenty eleven, um, um, a study HPTN O five two was published, uh, essentially demonstrating what we know around viral suppression for people living with HIV. That people who are virally suppressed can now transmit the virus through sexual contact, even if they're not using condoms or other barrier methods, right? So, although U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable, as some people have come to know uh, that scientific fact. So that happened, you know, uh, just about a year before PrEP was approved. And then in 2015, we had another study showing that for people living with HIV, uh, actually getting treatment um, to people uh, as soon as they're diagnosed is actually better for their own health and better for overall reduction of, of, of diagnoses and incidents. Um, you know, for, you know, population-wide, uh, you know, reductions in HIV acquisition. And so if you think about it this way, those three things together should have greatly reduced our HIV uh, diagnoses. We should have seen massive declines in HIV rates in this country um, based on those two things. If you have a medication that's approved uh, to prevent HIV that has like 99% effectiveness, uh, we also know that people living with HIV, uh, if they are on uh, treatment and get to be virally suppressed, they can't transmit HIV. Um, but we see, if you look at this graphic, we'll see that we actually have not um, achieved the level of reductions in HIV rates in this country um, because of various issues with racism, with transphobia, et cetera, and also just with access to care in our country. So um, not only if you look at the sort of top uh, line, the green, uh, you know, sort of total, where you see that we haven't really declined very much despite these uh, scientific advances. But then when you look at the racial data, uh, even below, you see where the declines have really happened. Uh, and if you look at the green line, that sort of lime green color, uh, which is uh, uh, Black and people of African descent, um, it's basically just stabilized. So despite being uh, most impacted by HIV in the United States, uh, we don't see the same level of benefit from uh, treatment or for uh, prevention through PrEP uh, as a result of some systemic issues I'll talk about in a second. So um, another kind of way to, to think about it. So again, we're now at the 10th anniversary of the first medication being approved for PrEP uh, for HIV prevention in the United States. And despite that, um, it took us a very long time to still kind of ramp up you know, access. It took two years or almost two years for the FDA to approve the first clinical guidance. And there were 80,000 new HIV infections in that two year period where we were waiting on clinical guidance for how to prescribe PrEP. It took another five years to begin tracking PrEP utilization in the United States. So we didn't even really know until 2017, roughly, how many people were actually using PrEP in the United States. And then it took another eight years to start dealing with the various financial barriers to uh, accessing PrEP. Um, and as you see, over that period of time, we're seeing um, mounting HIV uh, you know, infections happen in the United States. Um, and even today, there are no federal programs that cover the continuum of PrEP care for uninsured individuals. Um, so CDC, um, until very recently, was resistant to providing funding for uh, labs and for medication. 
um, very qualified health centers and a lot of uh, organizations in the United States that are um, either providing medical services for PrEP or uh, for HIV treatment, um, particularly on the PrEP side, because we have a generic, um, there is a kind of perverse incentive to keep prescribing brand name drugs that are very expensive um, because of the 340B program and other, like the advanced access program through Gilead that, you know, provide sort of rebates for prescribing the brand name drugs. So we're not seeing the level of savings in terms of uh, you know, public health resources and dollars that we should, because there's a generic prep available, um, you know, but, uh, you know, people uh, are still sort of perversely incentivized to prescribe, you know, the brand name drugs, especially if they are providing prep care uh, to uninsured individuals, uh, you know, as a, um, you know, as a either, you know, aid service organization or as a, uh, you know, uh, FQHC. Um, there's still not a national kind of awareness program, so there's still very low uh, kind of knowledge of what PrEP is or how it works, except for probably in the LGBT community, um, which becomes a, another problem. And also because, you know, in our kind of, you know, HIV prevention public health language, we talk a lot about risk and who's at risk and communities at risk and, you know, gay and bisexual men or men of sex with men at risk, transgender women at risk. Uh, cisgender Black women at risk. But um, the reality is most people do not think about themselves as, you know, quote unquote, at risk. People don't think about themselves as any more sexually promiscuous than other people or whatever. And so a lot of times when even people know about PrEP, they think, oh, that's for some other people over there and not that it's something that they could potentially benefit from. So, you know, for us at PrEP for All, um, we really think that if PrEP uptake is going to be increased equitably, a nationwide universal access program has to be designed and implemented for PrEP access um, that covers, you know, the entire uh, uh, spectrum. So what are some of the barriers to PrEP access? So again, um, cost um, has been a barrier um, and fragmented, complicated coverage um, system. So, for a lot of years before we had a generic drug, um, most insurance plans required um, prior authorization to access PrEP. Um, and so if you have to you know, call in a medication and then go through a mail order specialty pharmacy where you couldn't or were actively dissuaded from being able to get your you know, medications picked up at whatever local pharmacy was most convenient to you, um, that was a barrier for a lot of people. I've been on PrEP since 2015. And yeah, for the first, uh, actually the first, after I got the prescription, it took me two days to figure out how to fill it because uh, the, you know, I had to go through the my insurance company's specialty pharmacy to order. And I kept trying to get it filled at the pharmacies that were closest to my house or wherever I wanted to get it. And, um, it, you know, and so for, you know, and I was already in my 40s when I started PrEP, I think I was like 41. And um, for people who are younger, you know, for example, um, may not, um, you know, may just stop taking it if it takes a lot of work to access. So there's that issue. There's the kind of network inadequacy. So people with um, health insurance plans, knowing, you know, finding a doctor who knows about PrEP and how to prescribe it uh, is a problem. Physician biases, right? So physicians who either, and there have been some research that are looking at, that have looked at, you know, uh, doctors who think specifically that they're Black and, uh, you know, kind of Latinx patients aren't going to be adherent to the medication and actively have dissuaded them from, from getting it, or from saying to patients, well, it's new and I don't quite think we should be prescribing this yet until we really understand how it works. I've heard that from people. Um, and I've also heard um, from people, well, their doctors think, well, you're a, you know, you're a good Christian girl or good Christian boy, whatever the case may be, and making assumptions about, you know, people's risk based on what they think that person, you know, uh, may not, you know, quote unquote, be at risk. And so therefore dissuading their, their patients. Um, you know, the various structural, you know, isms in healthcare, right? So, um, lack of access to health care for, you know, people who are, um, you know, undocumented or, again, people living in states that have not expanded Medicaid, so they uh, fall in the coverage gap. Um, I talked about the perverse incentives for keeping, uh, you know, um, using 
high cost um, drugs over the generic. Again, lack of awareness and the social stigma. There's still a stigma to using PrEP um, because you're seen as promiscuous or reckless or whatever, as opposed to, no, I'm actually taking my own health care in my own hands and uh, you know managing my health uh, that way. And so those things become great stigmas. I know people on PrEP, for instance, who don't tell other people really that they're on PrEP um, you know, because of the fear of being judged or uh, discriminated against. So um, what needs to be covered? So this um, is using kind of uh, Medicare sort of fee schedule for, for coverage. And you can see that if you, so this is if you consider a um, generic use of, of the, the generic TDF FTC drug, where the sort of costs um, come in terms of PrEP access. So you see for the medication, if you're being prescribed a generic drug, it's only it's about $250 a year. Um, and the, the most expensive costs um, come out of uh, labs for, you know, STI testing and also physician visits um, tend to be the most uh, expensive uh, forms of cost. This is one thing to think about in terms of what uh, gets covered in terms of PrEP because it's more than just taking the monthly, you know, or the daily uh, pill and potentially the new injection um, every other month. But it is about um, kind of, you know, being screened regularly for, you know, HIV, for other STDs, um, pregnancy care uh, for people who uh, can get pregnant and uh, you know, your physician costs, and then the you know, kind of renal function test to make sure that you know, the medications are not adversely impacting your, your uh, kidneys. So what does successful coverage need to look like? I think first we need to center equity and think about um, where, in the, uh, where in the country geographically and also which communities currently have uh, less, less access and less utilage and really centering uh, a system of prep care on that. Um, minimal administrative burden. Many of us who have either used, you know, our own, you know, private insurance or have used, you know, um, you know, been on, on Medicaid or tried to, to get a, you know, copay card or something else to help cover the cost of medications, know that those things come with a lot of, you know, um, bureaucratic, uh, you know, loops to jump through, which become ways that people fall out of care um, or don't maintain, um, don't stay on PrEP because it's too much uh, kind of administrative mess. Um, coverage has to also be comprehensive, again, in terms of dealing with, uh, you know, your doctor visits, STI screenings, um, you know, et cetera. And sometimes other wraparound services for people who might need transportation or other things uh, in order to, to access uh, PrEP care um, has to be accessible both culturally and geographically, right? So it has to be close. People have to be able to get to appointments and prescriptions and et cetera, um, close to themselves. And it also has to be situated in the context to which people normally get access to care, right, which is um, part of a um, kind of cultural response, I think, um, has to be user friendly and it has to be sustainable, both for health health systems, public health systems, and sustainable for the individual, right, to be able to uh, maintain um, uh, PrEP, maintain staying on PrEP. So we also see not just with uninsured folks, but insured um, people still facing a lot of challenges. So, and this is something that I've been specifically working on at Prep for All. So in 2021, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the Department of Labor um, clarified an earlier ruling um, that uh, says that in people with uh, employer-based health coverage and also people with uh, you know, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare marketplace health plans, um, that those uh, insurance plans need to cover PrEP-related costs, including meds, visits, labs, with no cost sharing to patients. Um, but unfortunately, there's no accountability mechanism. And we're beginning to see kind of widespread insurance denials, uh, especially for lab costs, which often are the most expensive, uh, even when you know generic uh, prep is being prescribed, the labs really become uh, the most expensive. And so we began documenting a lot of cases directly from prep users. And currently, um, we have about 60 people who have filled out our online form and kind of described 
you know, how much they were charged, what uh, the charge was for, what their health plan, you know, was. And so I've been following up with health insurance companies, um, you know, that people have identified to say, hey, you need to be covering people and sending them the ruling from CMS uh, about that coverage. Um, and we still are seeing a lot of resistance to actually reimbursing those patients for their out-of-pocket costs. So, uh, and we're beginning to actually now engage people, you know, at CDC, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and even at the White House, I'll be presenting on the, the um, Presidential Advisory Council for HIV AIDS on this issue tomorrow, um, discussing, um, yeah, what, what we're beginning to see insurance companies try to sort of shirk the ruling, uh, you know, through these uh, and still charging patients for coverage uh, or for PrEP services that they are supposed to cover as insurers. And there was a recent uh, study, uh, not, I'm sorry, not a study, but a recent news story in CNN, the first news story kind of about this issue uh, that came out uh, just a couple weeks ago. Um, one of the biggest problems in terms of PrEP access um, that has was recently changed was um, many people who, as I mentioned earlier, who were, you know, could use PrEP and would probably avert, you know, uh, you know, contracting HIV were being missed uh, based on the way the clinical guidelines were written. And so a lot of the guidelines, um, well, the, the kind of first guidelines that were written for PrEP um, focused a lot on doing sort of sexual history risk profiles. So asking people, you know, one, have you, are you a man who's having sex with men? Are you transgender? Are you a high risk heterosexual? Which is a, a concept I still don't understand what that means. <laughs> but uh, it basically, asking people detailed questions about their sexual lives, um, which for a lot of, um, particularly um, for you know black and brown folks or whatever, the things that drive up the risk in our communities is not that we're having more unprotected, receptive anal or vaginal sex than other folks or more sex partners than other folks and not using drugs more than other folks. But some of these structural issues as I talked about earlier are causing the disparity. So, but if you're, if, if I'm in your clinic and you're asking me questions and, and my kind of risk profile doesn't match because I'm not having as much sex as the pro as the, the guidelines suggest, then you'll say, oh, you don't need to take PrEP. Meanwhile, I'm living in a community where people have less access to health care. Uh, you have high rates of people with HIV and people who are not virally suppressed. Um, and so I'm actually at higher risk for HIV based on those factors. Uh, but but I would be told in that sort of setting that, well, PrEP isn't for you. So as I mentioned here on the left, is a study uh, from 2018 actually looked at uh, cisgender women in the southern states um, and found that of two, 246 women who were screened for PrEP using those old guidelines, um, only 72 of those were found to meet CDC guidelines. Um, and only of that uh, 72, only four of them, one, two, three, four women had actually heard of PrEP, right? So we see that there's these, the way the guidelines kind of cut a lot of people who might actually be, be good candidates for PrEP out of, out of access. But recently at the end of 2021, CDC updated, updated those guidelines. Now, I don't know that they took my advice, but I had been saying for several years that actually in terms of PrEP, what we need to be asking people is, are you having sex or do you want to be? <laughs> and if, if the answer is yes, to either of those questions, let's make sure uh, you're HIV negative, that you uh, don't have hepatitis B, and then we can you know, do those tests and we can start you on PrEP. That should be the, the basis. And so now that is the sort of guidelines moving forward. And so hopefully that will give more uh, people an opportunity to talk about PrEP with their providers and have more, more uh, possibility of access. So one of the things that we've been involved in to sort of solve this issue is a national, um, uh, really advocating for a national program for PrEP. And, um, you know, for several reasons, one existing options for uninsured or underinsured individuals is very limited, it's fragmented and, and complex with limited uh, networks. Um, you know, calls led by us at, at uh, PrEP for All actually, um, one push CDC to recently um, allow for their grants to uh, jurisdictions to 15% um, of their uh, grants can be used for uh, paying for ancillary prep services 
um, you know, for people who are uninsured uh, or who are meeting some kind of coverage gap to be able to use PrEP. Um, there's two congressional bills currently uh, in Congress uh, calling for uh, a significant new investment in PrEP. So there could be increased um, resources uh, for uh, PrEP access. Uh, but most of the funding doesn't is not attached to a specific plan on how to uh, you know implement those resources. Um, there's a current plan by Johns Hopkins University that uh, is has been moving um, to uh, you know make a national prep program that's kind of based on the vaccines for children program. Uh, and uh, we have also participated in a, a recent uh, national sign on letter. Uh, with another 111 organizations calling for the Biden administration to commit to uh, such a program. Okay. Um, <clears throat> wait. Okay, so um, a couple of things that just to say, like in terms, some things we're thinking about in terms of uh, addressing the uh, the demand gap. Oh, wait. Uh, so uh, do, 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 do. let me go back. Uh, so some key features of what things that we think need to be in a national plan, right? So one is uh, coverage for uh, the uninsured and making sure folks are covered, um, you know, under uh, Medicaid. Um, eligibility uh, for that is really for providers instead of patients, because right now the burden is on patients to prove that they're poor enough or that they don't have enough insurance coverage to be uh, eligible for PrEP. And we actually want to reverse that and actually put the burden on the healthcare system and actually have more providers sort of come into the system as PrEP providers. And so they become eligible to provide PrEP and how to talk to their patients about PrEP, as opposed to putting the burden on patients to ask for PrEP and then to prove that they you know, need coverage. Um, so shifting that. Also shifting um, you know, the way PrEP currently is, is prescribed to really utilize the generic uh, TDF FTC more than the uh, brand name versions of PrEP for, which are perfectly fine for most people to use, um, you know, without any potential, you know, kind of side effects or adverse events. Um, and so we really need to actually maximize the generic use so that we're saving money and resources, um, you know, in, in our healthcare and public health systems. Um, why flexibility in medication access, right? So different people have different needs same day access some people prefer mail order some people prefer to use a local pharmacy giving people a 90 day supply as which as opposed to you know month to month i mean i can say that for myself once i was able to get a generic prep then all of a sudden you know my pharmacy just gave me 90 day supply which has been great cuz i don't have to like go to the pharmacy every month and um, pick up a supply um, so it, it can really change people's people's actual access. Um, we also think that there should be contracts with national labs of last resort to maximize access, right? Including home-based testing options, right? So um, we know that, as I mentioned before, labs become a major kind of problem, and we're seeing a lot of the prep people de being denied um, coverage by their insurance companies. It's because the in some cases the insurance company is like oh you went to a lab that was out of network well most people don't know what they just go to whatever lab you know when your doctor says hey go downstairs to the lab or go across the street to the lab or whatever and you know draw you know blood or whatever and you don't know that the the lab is out of the insurance company's network and so people are the burden becomes on patients to like figure all that out so we want to be able to to, to shift that um, significant effort through the CDC and existing grantees to expand network into non-traditional providers, right? So more community-based organizations uh, to pharmacies, which is already happening in some states where people can walk into a pharmacy and ask for PrEP and get, you know, a seven-day supply, two-week supply really quickly and, and then, you know, get uh, connected to services so they can then get the, uh, you know, HIV tests and other things that they need. Um, you know, in the process, but but not, you know, having a lot of barriers to doing that. So we've also been advocating for a national plan actually for the last two years or, or actually four years now, my God, uh, with an emphasis on accessible end user interfaces and self enrollment options, right? So what would it look like for a program that kind of looked like a, a regular health insurance program that people could like, you know, uh, you know, apply to get access 
and uh, be able to um, you know, make sure that the physician costs are covered, the labs would be covered from any provider, not just contracted. Their STI and HCV treatments would be covered um, if they were found to have uh, STIs or, or hepatitis C. Um, <clears throat> And if there's a PrEP user partnership at all levels, right, the people who are using PrEP really get to kind of help uh, determine what, you know, the, this sort of program and the services, um, you know, look like. Um, so, so some solutions to uh, addressing kind of two issues, I think, in PrEP access. So there's a demand issue and then there's an access issue. And so, and I think we have to deal with both of those. And so we know that in a lot of our communities, especially in black and brown communities that like, People hear about PrEP and know about it, but have a lot of, uh, of hesitation around it, right? Same way we're seeing in a lot of the, you know, kind of COVID-19 um, conversations about historical medical mistrust, hesitancy about using, uh, you know, biomedical, whether they be vaccines or sometimes treatments. Um, a lot of the things that we've been hearing about people's hesitancy about PrEP, about, uh, sorry, COVID-19 vaccines and the legacies of the Tuskegee syphilis study and other things like that. Most of us in HIV or in terms of treatment or trying to talk to people about PrEP hear those, have been hearing those things for years. And so it was no surprise to me that we were hearing those things in the context of COVID-19. So we have to really be fighting uh, misinformation and disinformation. And I think we need more research on the drivers and solutions of mistrust, hesitancy, conspiracy theories, et cetera, and to fund interventions to demystify public health systems and how PrEP and preventative medications work, right? Think about now, we're in the middle of COVID-19 pandemic and we still are trying to like talk to people in the middle of a pandemic about how vaccines work, right? <laughs> and, and how research works, uh, which has been a barrier, right? Because we haven't had really national programs to do that work for a very long time. Secondly, increased communications, messaging, research and implementation, right? We don't, we really need to learn more about how to talk to people about, uh, you know, PrEP and access to medications. And for too long, that messaging has kind of been like an afterthought, right? It's been like, oh, we didn't message this right. And so we need to figure it out. We need to get more on the front end of how we not just thinking that because we have some great medication that people are necessarily going to want to take it. And so we have to really do the work to understand how to talk to people and the kind of messaging needed to, to, to make that transition. We need to increase the number of PrEP prescribers, right? We don't currently have enough. Most people who need PrEP don't access much of our HIV prevention, community-based organizations or AIDS service organizations. And we need those organizations and other providers who see people to educate, offer, and connect them to PrEP services. We also have to reframe the, the issue of risk, right? Most people do not see themselves as at risk for HIV, uh, and that becomes a real barrier for how we talk about prevention options. And again, we need a national education campaign uh, that really updates people's information about HIV and, to, and knowledge about you know, uh, what being uh, virally suppressed or undetectable means and what you know, options people have in terms of, of PrEP. Um, and we haven't seen a national campaign like that in a very, very long time. And I think it's, it's time that we, we think of that. So some things to ask to address the access gap. So one, um, you know, center equity, right? So engineer a system to customize, uh, customize to serve the needs of most vulnerable populations and then add services for those, uh, for those less vulnerable patients once we actually address the people who have the least access first. Maximize flexibility and accessibility. So engineer a system that allows the most vulnerable to access PrEP as easily as possible, right? Um, and that means it should be universally usable at all providers where people already go for care. Um, strengthen system sustainability. So again, engineer a system that allows institutions that increase uptake of PrEP to increase revenue and strengthen and expand services, right? So incentivizing uh you know clinics or you know public health departments etc other people who are providing prep services if they actually uh begin to reach the populations that need prep uh, and also we need to go big 
you know, even if modestly effective, a universal prep system would generate actually massive savings for the healthcare system. So if we really maximize the savings, A, of using generic uh, medications as much as possible, we're just saving money um, for systems, but also the more people that we keep, uh, you know, we uh, keep HIV negative, um, you know, we save $420 million from, uh, you know, just healthcare costs. And I know that like making sometimes like cost arguments um, can be, uh, you know, useful for elected officials. I sometimes really get disgusted by them because I think we should be doing the right thing for people because it's the right thing to do as opposed to just because of cost. But it is, uh, you know, good to look at like what, you know, uh, you know, we can can save in terms of resources um, in, in that way. I'm gonna talk a little bit about our COVID-19 work and then um, open it up for questions. So. Uh, just a couple of things. So we uh, pretty early on, two years ago, at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, got involved uh, in looking at uh, the impact of COVID-19, right? We knew that the, uh, you know, pandemic when it reached the United States was going to disrupt HIV prevention and care services because a lot of uh, you know, organizations, medical providers, a lot of our infectious disease specialists and even community-based organizations were going to have to try to deal with the COVID-19, you know, uh, uh, pandemic, and it would probably slow down a lot of access to PrEP services and HIV. So we started working in New York. And then eventually, as it became clear we were going to have a lot of uh, vaccines that were going to become available, you know, as they did, um, that we would in late 2020, that we would um, also be having to look at, you know, kind of global access. And so, you know, just a couple things like the, you know, if you look at this, this graphic here, the share of uh, looking at countries by low income, middle, lower middle, upper middle income and high income countries, and looking at the share of the populations that have received at least one dose. So as you see, you know, in the dark blue or the royal blue high income uh, category, where you've seen the most people be able to access COVID-19 vaccines. And we see in low income countries, uh, uh, very little uh, access. Um, this is as late as uh, September, of this past fall of 2021, but that still hasn't changed in you know the roughly six months since this data was was produced. Um, <clears throat> wait, go back. So then, when we look at kind of again, look at it kind of where it, based on current you know uh, methods of, of vaccine access. Um, you know, what is the target date where kind of you know massive population coverage for global, uh, for COVID-19 vac vaccine access will be achieved. And so as you see, um, the dark blue countries, like within the first year of vaccines being available, they will, you know, were projected to reach, you know, kind of a critical mass of population being covered. And if you look at the dark purple uh, color, you, that you see like it would it barely be 2023 and maybe even later, um, for most countries uh, around the world to have access, and particularly, you know, the uh, the African continent, the Caribbean parts of uh, Asia, and uh, uh, Latin and Central America, um, you know, so uh, we see the the disparities in um, you know in access there. Another way to also look at the disparities is that we know. Uh, that the, you know, Pfizer, the mRNA vaccines, you know, Pfizer, BioNTech, and then the Moderna vaccines um, have been proven to be the most uh, efficacious in terms of um, preventing uh, illness and hospitalization and death, right? So, um, and yet most of the world, um, and especially the countries that even currently have even less access, actually have don't have access to the best vaccines right they have access to other vaccines that um you know aren't as as efficacious and so a lot of the work that we've been doing on the global covid-19 uh, vaccine access is really trying to push the Biden administration to invest more in uh making sure that uh low and middle income countries have access to uh, the mRNA vaccines, the U.S. Uh, public funds, what most people call taxpayer dollars, 
pay for a lot of the research, particularly for the Moderna vaccine that was really in partnership with the, uh, the National Institutes of Health uh, or, and NIAID in the development of that vaccine. And so the US could do a lot more to um, use its leverage with that particular vaccine um, to increase production of it globally and make sure that more people globally have access to an mRNA vaccine. Um, and so our strategy that we've been sort of talking about and doing a lot of, uh, of activism around is hit hard, hit fast, and hit globally, right, uh, in terms of addressing, um, you know, the, the, the crisis, right, which involves a lot of, uh, you know, more kind of technical issues in terms of uh, 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 licensing and sort of dealing with, uh, you know, kind of patent issues and making sure that places can can actually produce these uh, mRNA vaccines, uh, that there's sort of technology transfer to make sure that, uh, you know, we have the kind of facilities, manufacturing capacities to, uh, in, not just in the United States or in the West, to produce those mRNA vaccines. So really advocating for uh, African countries and other countries to be able to actually build their capacity to produce those vaccines, right, in, in, uh, you know, in their geographies. Um, and then, uh, you know, making sure again that then the, the implementation of access to those vaccines happens. So, uh, you know, we're dealing with both the, the sort of patent and intellectual property issues, the manufacturing issues, and then also how creating systems that really create equity in terms of, of implementation and distribution. Um, so uh, those are uh, the things that we are doing at Prepper All. So I'll stop my remarks there and open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenyon. That was fascinating. Oh, thank you. That was really, yeah, really, really interesting. I did that, that la the last slide or, or the one before it, it just threw me back to the, the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. It's so frustrating when you hear those same, almost, you know, the same arguments are, um, when we're talking about uh, ARVs for HIV and um, access in the global south and and the intellectual property and the generics and the cost. It's like you know when when will we get this? Right. Um, yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, I have a question. Um, there's one from Cassine Kone asking, um, may I know the difference between Travada and Descovy? Descovy. I heard some people say that Discovy is healthier than the Truvada. Yeah, and it is, this is, this is, I hear this a lot from people and it's, uh, for most people, untrue, right? That they're definitely with, with uh, TDFFTC or the drugs that are in brand name Truvada, um, that, you know, there are some, you know, potential uh, risk of, of kind of kidney uh, issues and also bone density issues, but those are very rare. And, um, and it's part of why a lot of providers, part of the sort of um, clinical guidelines are to see people using PrEP uh, quarterly uh, in order to make sure that, you know, a person who starts those medications are not, um, you know, receive, are not having adverse events. And so because those, those um, you know, are very, very rare um, occurrences, um, the, you know, TDFFTC or the brand name Truvada or if it's the generic um, is actually very safe for most people. I have been on uh, that medication for most of my uh, time on PrEP. Um, now, the Descovy, part of the, the, the issue is Descovy is is kind of a a, a formulation um, that is a smaller molecule, so the the pills are much smaller, and so you don't have some of the uh, kind of risk of uh, you know liver and I'm sorry, not liver, but kidney or issues or bone density issues with uh, you know what we call FTAF or the the brand name Descovy. Um, however, 
The SCOBY itself also has some other associated risks, which include uh, weight gain issues. And I think that not enough has been made of, of that. And unfortunately, and I'll just be very honest, I think that uh, you know Gilead as a company has really tried to promote this, the idea that uh, Discovi is safer than, uh, than Truvada, uh, or again, which is now a generic uh, in most cases, um, in order to maximize their profits from the brand name drug. Uh, but and, and have and have minimized some of the weight gain issues that I think that we're seeing both with uh, you know prep and Discovi, but also because those medications also exist as a backbone in a lot of um, HIV treatment regimens, and we're seeing associated weight gain with Discovi, which for some people can can be problematic, right? If people already have you know, cholesterol issues or, or high blood or, or uh, type two diet or diabetes and other things that the weight gain can be problematic for, um, that is, is, is true for the, so like, you know what I mean? So like, I would suggest that if you're interested in PrEP, like really talk to your doctor about what's best for you. Certainly if you suffer from any uh, comorbidities of, of other illnesses that may uh, you know, cause weight gain and may be problematic for you for those reasons, um, then Discovi would actually not be good for you. Um, so yes, I think um, a lot has been been kind of talked about in that realm, but I think it's a, a lot of it has been misinformation in order to uh, kind of get more people on the, the brand name drug for profit purposes and really not about public health. Well. Well, thank you. I've also, um, I think I've got the same question as well, uh, posted just a little earlier from Ibrahima Sankari. Um, oh. So uh, I, if I could, um, oh, uh, no, let me go back to Ibrahima, another question from him. What is the impact of PrEP on the HIV epidemic since its launch? That's a very good question. So uh, in a way, uh, so it, it, it has had a profound impact, but, but, but not enough of an impact, I guess, if I can answer it that way. I think in one way, um, the advent of PrEP has kind of revolutionized, particularly if you talk to people on PrEP, it has given a lot of people a lot more kind of assurance about um, you know, being able to stay HIV negative. And I think, you know, there's a lot of people who are, you know, uh, are like, well, we still need condoms and people can still use condoms. They can use condoms if they're on PrEP or, or not use condoms if they're uh, on PrEP. Um, but, but actually PrEP is more effective than condoms at preventing HIV, right? <laughs> and so um, I think that it has had a great, um, in terms of, uh, particularly, I think, particularly in, in LGBT community, I'll say specifically, where the, you know, rates of HIV are, are, are tend to be higher. And so a lot of people who have had access to PrEP, it has actually really revolutionized their own sense of, of safety and the kind of pleasure that they can have in their sex lives without the worry of, of HIV acquisition. Um, so it, in that way, it has had actually a pretty profound impact. I think that it has not had the kind of societal impact in terms of reducing HIV, uh, particularly in black and brown communities, because the, the access hasn't been there, frankly, right? Uh, we're less likely to be health insured. We're um, you know, less likely to have, have access, et cetera. Whereas among white gay men in particular, um, it has actually had a pretty profound impact in terms of really greatly reducing, um, you know, HIV diagnoses among white gay men um, in a way that it hasn't for other communities yet because of some of these like access issues uh, and creating uh, more, uh, you know, to, to really for our communities to know more about PrEP and how to use it in order to like really create more demand for it as well. Thanks, Kenyon. Uh, I think, uh, wow, it's 1057. Um, I'm, I'm going to take just one question. Uh, if this is from Sharon, the last question, um, what have you seen as the most effective messaging strategy to speak about HIV and COVID together? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a great question. Yeah, right? Right. right. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know that, 
I don't know that I've seen a uh, messaging that's talked about them in kind of connected to each other. I, I have a whole different presentation I've done for other groups about like looking at the kind of history of HIV sort of messaging and and where and and how COVID has borrowed or not borrowed from that or what the sort of intersections of that messaging are. Um, I haven't seen those come together in any like public campaigns per se. Um, I will say this that I think that um, you know when I talk to people, particularly a lot you know friends of mine and people in my community who are living with HIV, there's somewhat of a frustration because of you know to be frank, there's a lot of like you know sympathy that people have when people you know announce that they've tested positive for COVID mm -hmm. um, in way and a lot of social support and kind of societal support in a ways that people living with HIV still don't get. A lot of people with HIV, if they announce that they're living with HIV, they're still like, the, well, how did you get it? What And what did you do wrong to you know, contract HIV? And so I think partly because HIV um, is still so much associated with people's taboos around sex and drug use, mm -hmm. that there still is a great amount of stigma uh, in terms of, of you know, contracting HIV in ways that don't exist as much for uh, for COVID in a way. And I think that, um, you know, we can use this moment, I think, particularly because we have more of the, the world, people who never paid attention to public health, thinking about public health now, that we can start to ask the questions about uh, not just COVID-19 or frankly, not just about HIV, but frankly, what is the future of public health in the United States and in the globe, frankly, and where, what do we need to be doing differently in order to uh, be able to adequately address existing epidemics and pandemics and be prepared for future ones? And I, I want to see more of those conversations about public health as a field and what the future of public health needs to look like uh, both domestically and globally uh, in order to uh, prevent the kind of death that we've seen from both COVID and HIV. Right. Nice way to end, Kenyon. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so um, there, there is actually, we, we have run out of time now. There is one last question um, asking about the side effects of PrEP um, from an anonymous attendee. And um, unless you'd very quickly like to take that, Kenyon, I could refer um, the attendee to your website. Um, if you just want to repeat that again, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, so I'll do, I see the question here, so I'll do quick, yeah. yeah. So one, um, uh, PrEP for most people does not do not have uh, a lot of like long-term side effects. It's why if you start taking PrEP, you will see your doctor, certainly like the first year or two, every three months um, to make sure that you're, you know, they'll, you know, do a blood draw, make sure you're not having any, any, uh, you know, kidney issues. I've been taking PrEP since 2015. So now this April will be seven years for me on PrEP and I've had no adverse, uh, issues. So, um, you know, that's, there's that. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, that, um, wrap it up. Thank you so very, very much, Kenyon. Um, as I said, African services, um, as an agency, we're um, looking at uh, promoting PrEP uh, much more than we ever have before. And this has been um, extremely informative um, for us to take that work forward with. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. All right. Um, so have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Um, we will be uh, here again next month. Um, check our website for details and um, take good care. Thank you. Bye bye.